Hello, everyone. Welcome to week 10, Decode Silicon Valley Startup Success. The topic for this week is legal things and notice that could cure your business. As you all, here's the agenda for today. The first 15 and 20 minutes will be topic overview, lead by Jane and Ryo. And then we have an hour speaker keynote and Q&A session with our guest speaker today, Sam. And then we have the last 30 minutes for logistics and discussion for break rooms. All right, so let's begin by thinking about the idea of startup law. Um, many entrepreneurs, they, they kind of focus on their startup idea and the product and getting a team behind it um, that they forget to focus on also um, on the critical aspect of um, taking care of the legal aspects. And so that's why we'll go into that today. So some of you may have seen the movie, uh, The Social Network, or read the book, You Don't Get to 500 Million Friends Without Making a Few Enemies. Um, but basically, for those who haven't seen it, the, they, they portray the story of the founding of Facebook and the lawsuits that have emerged um, through their existence. Um, but in specific on that, uh, on that picture of the YouTube video, um, the courtroom scene in specific is a great depiction of what possibilities can arise in a legal sense if there are some flaws to how um, a company is run. Um, and yeah, if you haven't watched the movie, I would recommend checking it out. It's a great, um, great watch. Um, and then diving into some uh, important legal concepts. So the first one is non-disclosure agreement. Um, whenever two parties, they discuss non-public uh, confidential information, it's recommended to have a legal contract um, like an NDA, um, which basically captures the terms and conditions of how the information can be shared um, and distributed outside of the two parties. So any non-disclosure agreement can be between two partners, it can be between an employee and an employer, or basically anyone who um, gets together and discusses um, private information. Um, and it's very important to understand the obligations and um, the terms and conditions before the um, agreement is executed. Um, and so, for example, um, Tesla and Aurora, there was a lawsuit that arose um, and it resulted, there was a breaking of an NDA and it resulted in, um, and it re resulted in a lawsuit. So uh, basically it was a, it was between Tesla and Aurora, which um, was a former Tesla employees self-driving startup company. And Tesla accused um, Aurora and its founder, Sterling Anderson, of um, approaching their Tesla employees and making use of some of Tesla's confidential information. Um, and this was settled by um, Aurora paying a small fee of $100,000 to such a big company like Tesla. But uh, this is just one of the millions and millions of cases um, that have uh, resulted because an NDA has been broken. And just as a note, NDAs, they're not only active during the engagement of the two parties, but um, it's also perpetual. Um, moving on to the next concept, um, usually many startups have more than one founder. And so the founders do have to agree on several decisions um, and action items. And some of these uh, decisions are better to be covered in a formal legal agreement. And uh, some of the important decisions, they, they include how much stake each founder gets, um, which has to be set in the document, um, talks about monetization also, or how to bring in new talent. These are all things that um, are gone over in uh, co-founders agreements. So now we know there's a definite need for us to have an expert lawyers and there are big law firms like DLA Pipers or Dentons. And also there are alternately more affordable options like counsel. And you might also consider at what state you're served, you will get an in-house lawyer. Also, you might also want to consider the type of insurance you want to invest in to cover um, the legal liability for, for the startup. And here are some more examples of startups involved in lawsuits. And against their many, and it's just not the time and the money that a startup will lose. 
if proper legal attention is not taken care of. But is the opportunity lost when attending to all of these lawsuits? And finally, here, here are just some, um, some of the topics we are considering when it comes to the legal aspect of start. We are not going to go to all of this topic today as um, this is a huge list. But all of these are very important. And the one that we want to focus on today is just IP protection because the real assets of a startup is the intellectual property. And we should take care of, you should take care of protecting the IPs through the legal tools. And I'm very pleased to welcome our guest speaker today, Sam Angus. Sam advises founders, board of directors, startups, venture back and mature companies, and investors in the board set of transactions, including early and late stage equity and debt financing, mergers and acquisitions, strategic and joint ventures and corporate governance and board members. He is currently the partner in the venture capital and corporate group of Fenwick and West LP. Sam also sits on the advisory board of the Leicester Center for Entrepreneurship and Innovation at UC Berkeley. Um, welcome, Sam. Nice to be here. Thanks for having me. Should I uh, uh, now start on my uh, part of the presentation? Yes, yes, please. And Jane, okay. uh, uh, stop the sharing and then we can let Sam to share the screen. Okay. Can people see this? Yes, it's, it's slowly. Yes, we can see it. Okay, great. Um, well, thanks again for having me. I've done this class, uh, this session, a year uh, last year, I think last semester. Um, just by way of background, I'm a partner at Fenwick and West. We are a full service law firm, one of the original two law firms in the Silicon Valley that started in the 70s. We work only with technology companies and our, our model is to represent founders and um, startups early in their growth cycle through their full evolution and uh, all the way to um, uh, IPO, liquidity and beyond. We represent a lot of public tech companies as well. Um, I've represented, uh, I've been doing this for over 20 years. I've represented a lot of the top technology firms. I, um, I currently work with uh, Airbnb. I incorporated that company uh, about 12 years ago and uh, actually 13 years ago and have been working with them ever since. And so that's a sort of a classic, you know, client for our firm. Um, because we work with technology companies, we have extremely deep intellectual property expertise and corporate expertise. So it's one of the things our firm is known for. Um, so today's session is about the sort of main things that could really undermine your startup and things to be worried about um, that I've come across, issues that I've come across in my um, uh, the years that I've been practicing with startups and founders. And oftentimes we take on clients, not at the very beginning, but um, when they want to raise money or right after a fundraise, if something has gone wrong. And so I've come into companies' situations and seen what some of the pitfalls are. A part of my practice is also representing investors in their investment side of these transactions. So I know what investors look for in companies and the things that give them some concern. And so this list is not complete. There are an infinite number of things that can go wrong and that are important, but it is some of the things based on my pattern recognition that I've come across that are the more important, more common types of issues. You know, I did this, I did this class probably before COVID four years ago in person. I don't know if probably none of you were there, but one of the questions I ask in person, and people raise their hands is, how many of you have started or are thinking about starting a startup? And uh, you know, on Zoom, it doesn't quite have the same, 
the same response. Um, but I'm seeing the virtual hands go up, and so it's um, it's quite overwhelming. So this is consistent when I've taught at other universities as well. It's an incredible time to be an entrepreneur. I will just say that. Um, and I've worked with companies during the 90s, during the first internet bubble, and during when the bubble crashed through the 2007, 2008 financial meltdown. Today, I have never seen it from, a, from an entrepreneur's perspective be a more positive time to start a company than it is today. Um, and there's lots of reasons for that, but it's beyond the scope of this presentation. So without further ado, and um, I have allotted, I'm, this is going to be sort of skimming the top of the waves of these issues, because I want to allot, you know, 15, 20 minutes at the end. So I'm going to go for 40 minutes or so um, to take any questions uh, that people might have. And if you have a question and want to ask it during, while I'm talking during the middle of the presentation, I'm, uh, that's fine. Feel free to do that, and I will, um, and I'll try and answer it. If I can't, we'll, we'll answer it when I'm done. Okay. Thing, un, things unnoticed that could kill your business. Top legal issues for early stage startups. Number one, failure to form a legal entity or the right legal, legal entity for your startup. Before you start uh, working on your venture, um, without forming a company, all the rights and all the liabilities will rest on the founders. So why is it important to, find, to form a legal entity and form the right legal entity early? There's a couple different reasons. The, the, the obvious one that you hear a lot is to limit liability. I will say that that's less important for technology startups. This isn't like a restaurant or a taxi business where you're potentially subject to a lot of liability early on. Most technology startups are in development for the early part of their uh, evolution. And so there's not a lot of liability there to protect the founders from. Um, but, it, but forming a legal entity, be it a corporation, or a limited liability company or a partnership will protect the owners of that business from claims made by debtors and claimants against the business. That's one of the principles of US corporate law. Um, the other, I think more important reason is to allocate economic and ownership interests in the venture to founders. Without a company, it it's, can be ambiguous and it can be difficult to define who owns what of, of, of a venture. With a company and a corporation, you have shares. With an LLC, you have membership interests and in a partnership, you have partnership interests. So that, that gives it a very objective way to say, I own 50%, you own 50%, or I own 75% of the shares of this company and you own 25% of them. It defines at a given point in time, the ownership structure of the company and it provides a basis for, for selling more ownership, shares or membership interests in the future. Um, it's also an entity is a vehicle for doing transactions, raising money, entering into license agreements, um, entering into customer agreements. So the question comes up from founders is, should we form an entity? It costs a little bit of money. It's not that expensive. The process has been fairly formulaic. There's a number of places on the internet where you can do your own company. Um, I like to say when founders have committed to the company and when IP is being created is, the, is a good time to start your company. And when the ownership among the founders needs to be established, that, that is the time when you want to set up your own company. Um, there's also tax reasons why it's better to set up the company earlier in the development of the IP rather than later. Uh, there can be tax issues if you and your co-founder are developing, let's say, a piece of software that's very valuable, 
you don't have a company and then comes time to contribute that into a company that can create some tax issues for the founders. It's especially important that even if you have the company form, that you actually issue shares or ownership interest to the founders at the same time. If there's a gap in time between the two, and they're two different processes, you can form an entity with no shareholders. You can enter into contracts and so forth with that entity. If you wait to issue shares, that can create problems and issues. So the types of legal entities that we come across, they're different types. Um, and the principal difference is in the way they're taxed. Uh, there is limited liability companies, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with. Those are treated normally like a partnership for tax purposes, meaning the entity itself does not pay tax on profits. It is the ownership is owned by members, not shareholders. And it is governed according to what's called an operating agreement. It's a very flexible vehicle. So you can have a lot of different governance and ownership and uh, economic structures with an LLC. Corporation is more rigid. Um, but as, as uh, you, many of you probably know, a corporation is the favored, the most favored form of entity by investors in the Valley and in, in, you know, in, in tech. That isn't to say that LLCs can't get funded, they do. And there are some advantages to having an LLC, but far and away, I'd say over 95% of all startups are corporations. Corporations, and I think part of the reason is they're well understood. Um, the ownership is shares issued to shareholders. The liability, like, an, like a limited liability company, is limited to the owners, the shareholders. Unlike a limited liability company or a partnership, a corporation does pay tax on its profits, and that's a difference. Um, and so certain types of transactions involving a corporation are less tax efficient than they would be with a LLC. That is, tip, that is normally not a big deal for early stage startups. Um, first of all, most early stage startups and not, some not so early stage private companies are not profitable. And if you're not profitable, you don't pay taxes and you get to subject to certain conditions, carry over those losses into future years so that when you do become uh, profitable, you can use those what are called net operating loss carry forwards, you can use those to offset profits and reduce your tax. So that avoiding tax normally is not one of the way, not one of the big reasons why you would form an LLC over a, um, a corporation. And I, I, I point this out, a lot of venture capital funds, which are limited liability partnerships, or limited liability companies, by definition, many of them cannot invest in limited liability companies because they don't want to have the taxes passed through to them. They'd rather them stop at the corporate level. So that's a little bit technical, but I wanted to mention that. Then there's a thing called an S Corp, which is a corporation that is taxed like a limited liability company in a partnership, meaning the S Corporation doesn't pay any tax but the S corporation is subject to a lot of restrictions. It can have only one class of stock. So that sort of rules it out as a venture back company because in a venture back company, you have common stock for the employees and you have preferred stock, which is a different class for the investors. An S corporation also is limited as to the total number of shareholders it can have. And so it's generally not a good vehicle for a startup that intends to take venture capital money. Let's see here, do we have some questions? Oh, are you guys having trouble hearing me? Because I do get that from time to time. Okay, I'm, I'm seeing, I'm all clear. All right, 
Um, okay, so that's a very brief primer on forming a legal entity. The, the highlights, the high points are form it early. Generally, you're going to want to form a C corporation. Important to issue shares to the founders early. And we'll get into some of the things about issuing shares to the founders, which is important. But I think the big message here is, 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 is do it early in the process. Um, number two, and this was somebody in the intro um, very astutely mentioned IP. You guys, I mean, you guys are all, uh, or many of you are developing technology companies and IP is a core asset of those technologies, if not the, the most important asset. Make sure that the company owns all the IP that it is developed or used. It sounds like a no brainer, but actually this comes up from time to time with companies in due diligence. So the first thing is when you're starting a company and if you're starting a company out of college, it probably isn't an issue, but oftentimes founders start, com start companies either when they're working for another company or shortly after they've worked for another company. It's hard to um, live without a salary, I get it. Um, if, they're work if founders are working for a different employer, they need to be very careful about the way they exit that employment relationship and how they develop IP for their new venture. Now, this issue is governed by state law. So different states have different rules around competing with your employer. Now, you certainly can't use your employer's confidential information. You can't use your employer's equipment, including email, computers. You shouldn't be using developing things on the employer's time. So you shouldn't be like during work hours working on your startup. Those are all things that are very, you have to be very, very careful about. Why is that a big deal? Let's say you, you violate some of those suggestions and you go ahead, you, 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 you develop a new company IP, you contribute that IP into your new startup with your co-founder, you're off to the races, you quit your job, you raise venture capital, the, the risk is practical, it, it, there's a practical risk and then there's a legal risk. The legal risk is whether the former employer could legally assert claims over the IP, because presumably with your prior employer, you signed what's called an invention assignment agreement. And that's something we would recommend that the startup have all of its employees sign. And most big tech companies will have their employees sign something that says anything you develop on our time with our equipment, we own. And on top of it, you agree to keep it all confidential. So you've signed that agreement with your, with your employer. So the legal issue is could your former employer assert claims over the IP you've developed for your new startup? Part of the answer is, well, why would they? I mean, if it's not in a competitive area, let's say you work for Pinterest, but you're developing some battery technology in your new startup, probably unlikely that Pinterest is gonna wanna assert some ownership over that um, or some make some claim against the IP. So the first question is, what, it, what is it you're doing? Is it potentially arguably competitive with what your existing employer or your former employer uh, is uh, the business they're in or the technology that they developed or that they're planning to develop. The second issue, sort of practical issue is, well, when you have investors invest in your company, your new startup, they are gonna ask you, well, what were you doing before? Did you work on, the, on this idea while you were at your old employer? Does your old employer know about this? The reason they're concerned is once they invest in your company, their options are limited. Uh, and if your company becomes, and I've seen this happen, company um, developed 
um, technology, founders developed technology, why they were working for a big technology company. Um, company spent eight months develop, further developing their technology and gaining traction. Um, the startup then became extremely successful and very, very high profile. And their prior employer made a claim against the IP that needed to be settled. I mean, ultimately, these things are all settled and it just costs money. But that's the thing you worry about that if you get super, super successful, somebody at your prior employer is gonna say, hey, didn't those guys work for us? And you know, what is it they were working on? And well, that company's now worth more than we are. Do we have any, are, were they using any of our IP? So that's, that's why you wanna really be careful at this phase and how you extract yourself from your existing employer, the way you do it and how you develop IP. Um, the IP you develop is normally consideration for your stock that you're purchasing in your new startup. So, and usually the price, as many of you probably know, is very, very low for your stock because all you have is a shell company. There's no real assets. Um, and so you contribute what you've developed to date to the company. The company now owns it. The company gives you shares. Um, and you agree, you sign an invention assignment agreement, the agreement I just mentioned, that says that anything you work on while you're at the company is owned by the company. And this is important. That agreement, that it, it's called an employee invention assignment and confidentiality agreement, is very, very important. It will get, uh, in any financing you do, the, there will be a representation in the stock agreement that you enter into with the investors that says, and there's hundreds of these representations, and this is just one, that the company, all of the company's employees and contractors have executed the company's standard form of invention assignment agreement. Oh, and we want to see a copy of that. We want to review that document. So that's, that's very, very important. Um, I had a client once that had was an open source company that had developed, had this sort of open source culture, which is a very sort of non-hierarchy, um, non uh, sort of structured management um, uh, um, organization. And they were raising their first financing. They had not raised any money. Their first financing, they were raising $100 million at a billion dollar pre-money valuation. So there's, the investor said, your, your company's worth a billion dollars. We're gonna, we'll buy a hundred million dollars worth of your stock for roughly 9.9% .9 of your company. In the course of due diligence, of course the investor is gonna do a lot of due diligence. They discovered that none of the employees engineers had signed invention assignment agreements. They had just been working for the company, developing software, but they had not signed this agreement, which was a problem in the financing. And part of the issue that we needed to resolve was getting all of the employees, and there were hundreds, to sign these agreements. And so that's why this is important. It comes up in every, um, in every financing, I would say, as a, as a due diligence matter. So IP is the core asset of a technology company. And IP is a very broad concept. It encompasses a lot of different things, everything from just know-how or an idea to pictures, words, programming languages, formulas. There's different types of intellectual property protection that gives the owner of the intellectual property different rights. Protection is generally a negative right. It doesn't give you the right to use an idea, but it gives you the right to prevent somebody else from using it. So this chart, which is very summary, gives you sort of a high level overview of the different types of intellectual property protection. Trademark, which is branding, which is the Nike logo, uh, the Coke logo, the Airbnb logo, Trademark protection is the way in which consumers recognize your company, your good or product, your good or service that you're, you're offering. Trademarks can be extremely valuable, generally for consumer companies. 
Um, sometimes for you know deep tech companies, they can have they can certainly have value, but the Nike logo, I would say, is sort of fundamental. I, I represented a company years ago that owned the rights to Tetris. And I don't know how many of you are familiar with Tetris. I'm dating myself because this is a game that goes back, you know, 30, 40, maybe longer. Um, and in the course of, we represented the company when it was being sold to Jamdat. This was in the 2000s. Um, and in the course of due diligence, Jamdat discovered that the actual underlying software code for Tetris was not protectable. It was open source, and there were there were many different alternative ways to code the functionality of the Tetris game with other with with code that was original. And therefore, if you had a copyright on the code, and copyright only protects the literal code, the literal words on the page, um, if if you could say it in a different way or program it in a different way. There's nothing the company, my client, could do to stop you. What our client did own was the Tetris brand. And it turned out that the very, it's a relatively simple game in terms of functionality. It turned out that the real value here was playing the Tetris game and not playing some other generic version of the Tetris game. So that, that's, a, that's an illustration of sort of the value of you know, a trademark. Copyright, as I mentioned, covers software programming language. So the actual software language, words on a page, uh, a novel, a book, a, a movie, the actual images on the movie. It is literal. You cannot copy the content without violating the copyright. But if you do it differently, you have some flexibility. Trade secrets are, as the name implies, it is any idea, innovation that is that has economic value that you keep secret. Um, the famous, the most famous trade secret here um, is the, the formula for Coca-Cola that is locked in a vault and no one knows about. Um, the beauty about trade secrets is it lasts forever as long as the uh, idea is kept secret and has economic value unlike patents or copyrights that expire after a certain number of years. Um, then there is another set of IP, which is contract rights and NDAs. And then finally, patent rights, which are innovation, which provide the holder with the right to exclude others from using the innovation. Uh, some of these rights arise naturally by operation of law. Some of them you have to make filings with governmental agencies such as copyright and patent in order to get the protection or enhanced protection. Same with, same with trademark. Okay, so let me just see here. So I'm gonna move on past IP to the next issue. This is a important topic we touched on earlier, breaches of obligations owned to former employers. Um, this is the types of restrictions that an employer can place on an employee who wants to leave. I have clients, whenever they hire a new employee, they ask me to review the employee's current offer letter and agreements with its, with its current employer. And they're looking for things such as non-competition clauses, which say you won't compete against your employer, non-solicitation and no hire clauses, which say you won't solicit a employer's employees. Um, and then also, of course, we talked about employee invention assignment agreements and non-disclosure clauses. All of those things are relevant when you're hiring somebody from another employer. California, these, these types of rules are all governed by state law. California among states is, is a right to work state and um, probably gives employees the most freedom to work on another idea while they're employed 
and to start a competing business while they're employed. Non-competition agreements are generally non-enforceable in California, absent certain narrow situations, um, and no hire clauses are not legal in California. Uh, and so um, employees have a, a fair amount of flexibility in California to go work for another company, but they still need to be careful here. This is similar to the issue we talked about with founders. Okay, capitalization or your equity structure, which is what type of shares and who owns those shares of your company. Um, one of the things to make sure when, when is that the structure that you're using is standard and straightforward and not too complicated. Uh, as I mentioned, it is um, important that you use common stock to issue to the founders and preferred stock when you get ready to raise money. Um, it's important also that all issuances of equity be documented with an agreement. Um, I've represented many companies when they've come to me, they, we've discovered that they have promised equity to others who have provided service for services to them. Either they promise them verbally or in an email or pursuant to um, um, some understanding. That is potentially a big due diligence issue and can create some significant claims down the road. Because while the company is not that valuable, it's probably not a big issue. But if and when the company becomes extremely valuable, that is when um, claimants will come out of the woodworks and assert that they should have been issued shares or equity in the company. And if it happens at the time of a transaction, such as a financing or an acquisition of the company, that person can have a significant amount of leverage and uh, extract a, a significant price for resolving the issue. So the first question is, how to allocate the initial equity among the founders? Um, the real question is, is what percentage of the company should each founder own at the onset? Keep in mind that among the founders on day zero, they're gonna own 100% of the company. It's like a pie. And then going forward, to the extent the company needs to raise capital or hire employees, that pie is gonna get divvied up. And so whether or not the founders end up with 2% of the company, as in the case of Box, or 35% of the company in the case of Airbnb, will be a function of capital efficiency. How efficient is the company at growing using the least amount of capital and uh, doling out the least amount of equity to new hires. And so, you know, uh, it, 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 it doesn't get any better than um, the way things start on day one. Um, the second question here is, we talked a little bit about the tax issue. That is um, something that you want to make sure that when you develop IP and you've contributed to the company, that you issue your shares at the same time, that you don't wait. Um, that can create, to the extent that, the, that you're deemed to be receiving shares with a value in excess of what you're actually paying for them, you will be subject to tax. And then, as I mentioned, you want to avoid off cap table equity, such as promises of stock to friends, advisors, and family members. That is a, um, a big no no, and it can cause issues with your capitalization. Investors, not surprisingly, care immensely about the integrity of the cap table because that's their ownership. And if that is wrong, if they find out that's wrong after they've invested, 
that's not a good thing. I will note this, um, this applies to any issuance of stock, uh, grants of stock option, uh, issuances of safes or convertible notes, if you're doing that. All of those things for a pre-public company have to comply with the securities laws and must be structured under an exemption from the reg registration requirements. Uh, registration is uh, refers to a company that has gone public. It registers its shares with the SEC and sells shares to the public. As everyone knows, that's reserved for the most mature companies. There's a lot of legal requirements for that. It's a big transaction. All of the venture back companies raise money privately and they are issuing shares and securities under an exemption. And these exemption have a lot of different requirements depending upon which exemption you're relying on. And they're highly technical. And so these are one of the things when you're issuing shares you need to be aware of. Generally not an issue if the issuance is gonna to be to two founders or three founders. It's usually very, um, you, it, 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 there is an exemption readily available for that. But beyond that situation, if you're granting stock options, if you're raising around uh, to investors, that's when the issue of an exemption can become more um, complicated. One thing I do want to touch on, I'm not sure if we covered in this session, let's see what this one is. Um, yeah, I think it, we, we can touch on it in this session. One of the most important things the founders will do initially and will determine the success of your company has nothing to do with your idea. Um, and one of the most important things as a CEO that the CEO can do is recruiting and retaining employees. Uh, John Doerr, who was one of the senior partners of Kleiner Perkins, uh, once famously said that his job as a venture capitalist when he invests in a company is to help the company recruit and retain employees. And it's always been a issue in the Silicon Valley, in California, among tech companies that recruiting is very challenging. Well, it has never been harder than it is today. Um, and retaining employees has never been harder. Um, and so it is, a, it is a big issue that companies focus in on day in and day out. How do you do it? Well, one of the ways startups have an advantage over big companies like Google, Facebook, Cisco, who can pay lots of money to people is startups can issue low priced stock options that have the potential to appreciate significantly in value. And this is in addition to the other advantages that startups offer in terms of culture and in terms of freedom to work and so forth. Um, but stock options, I think you'll find early on are gonna be a key component of recruiting employees. Um, some of the features of stock options are, well, let me start with the basic definition. A stock option is the right to buy a number of shares of common stock from the company for an exercise price. Um, that exercise price has to be equal under the tax rules to the fair market value of the common stock when the option is granted to the employee or, or a consultant. So that's the first rule. When you grant the option to the employee, it has to, the, the exercise price has to be equal to the fair market value of, of the common stock. And I will say that the fair market value of the common stock is determined these days, most, most likely by a valuation firm that the company engages. Um, because if you're wrong on the fair market value and you grant an option that is let's say too cheap, then there are significant tax, adverse tax consequences to the optionee and to the company. So that's why a lot of companies, there's almost a cottage industry now of valuation firms popping up. Um, that valuation though is much less 
typically than the value per share that you will sell preferred stock to an investor for. And that's part of the advantage of issuing common stock to employees is one, they get it for a lot less. It doesn't have all the rights that the preferred stock that the investors have, but uh, it is cheaper. It, and also, as I'm sure many of you know, these options will vest based on continued service to the company. Typical vesting period is none of the shares vest for the first year of employment. On the first year, 25% of the shares will vest. And thereafter, over the next three years, the remaining shares will vest on a monthly basis. And so by four years, that option becomes fully vested. Um, the option doesn't have to be exercised by the employee unless the employee stops providing services or is terminated by the employer. Then, then the employee typically has a, a pretty short period of time, usually 90 days, to exercise the option or it disappears. Um, many companies these days, as you may have heard, are extending that post-termination exercise period from 90 days to two years or even seven years, but typically it's 90 days. Um, and that's one of the benefits of an, of an option while you're an employee is you don't need to make an investment decision. You can just hang on to this option and decide you're not going to pay the exercise price until you see how the company is doing. And then the tax treatment of options differs, depends on whether it's an incentive stock option or a non-qualified stock option. Um, generally, employees get incentive stock options, non-employees get non-qualified stock options. That, uh, that issue of the tax treatment of options, I could spend five hours on, so I will, I will save you <laughs> that. Uh, another issue that comes up with employees is employee classification. Whether, whether a individual providing services to a company is treated as an employee and subject to employment laws or is treated as a contractor. Um, a lot of early stage companies sort of take the position, oh, we're going to treat this guy as a, or a woman as a contractor because we don't need to withhold and we don't need to provide all these benefits. Um, in that, as a practical matter, probably won't matter while you're small. Uh, I will say that whether somebody is a contractor or an employee is not dependent upon the agreement of the parties. It's dependent upon a lot of different factors. And more likely than not, I think much more likely, almost a certainty that if somebody is working for you almost full time, they are an employee. So just something to keep in mind. I've had, cl I've had clients who've gone along for years and been working with, quote, contractors, a group of contractors, and then had the labor commission come in and do an audit and say, huh, these people are all employees. You haven't been paying withholding tax or employer's tax or benefits. You've got to, you've got to now, one, pay all those, those taxes and those benefits, and, and you're subject to penalties. Um, how does this come up? How does the labor department even know about this? It, typically, it comes up when an, uh, somebody's been terminated, and then they go to the unemployment office, and they try and collect unemployment insurance, and the unemployment uh, uh, the, the, the labor department says, well, you're not an employee. It says here, you're a contractor. You're not entitled to unemployment insurance. And, and, that's, and that's what sort of kicks things off. So um, bottom line here is be careful about this. I think if you fly under the radar while you're small, but uh, you know, if, you get, if you get larger and you're hiring and you're terminating employees, this is going to come up and be an issue at some point. So this one, avoid creating too much complexity or structural control terms, has come up in the last, I would say, seven years or so as a, a real focus of a lot of founders. Founders, most recently, and I think probably encouraged by um, the likes of Zuckerberg and other founders, have asked for more devices in their corporate documents that give them more control over the company. I'm talking about non-economic control, things like when the company can enter into a specific transaction or controlling the votes of shares, um, controlling the board, 
putting in place structural things. Now, I've helped create some of these devices for, for a lot of clients who've wanted them. My sort of overarching advice is early on, keep things simple. Um, investors will look at these uh, and will assess two things. One, can they work with a company that has these types of restrictions in terms of control? And two, what does it say about the founders? Are the founders too focused on maintaining control, i.e. avoiding downside, than they are about thinking about upside? So I, I mention that and I say that with a straight face because I have advised clients on implementing a lot of these different structures. And what are these devices? Some of them you may have heard of. One is sort of super class or dual class voting structure. Some public companies have these. Snap is one. Airbnb is another. Uh, more rarer is giving certain founder directors multiple votes. Delaware law permits a director to have more than one vote. And so it is theoretically possible that the board seats held by the founders have two votes and everyone else has one. So that's something you need to do. Restrictions on transfers can be a control mechanism, but it can also be, I, I think, a smart thing to do for companies. And we recommend that startups implement some form of blanket restriction on transfers so they can control who gets on their cap table, who sells stock, and they can control the value of their shares. FF common stock is a type of preferred stock that founders get to optimize tax treatment if they ever sell those shares in what's called a secondary transaction. And then there are voting agreements that stockholders can enter into with other stockholders agreeing that, hey, you're going to give me your right to vote your, your stock. This is something that Facebook did while I was private. And um, Zuckerberg had a lot of his control through this mechanism. The other key area of control is the board. Every material transaction in a corporation has to be approved by the board. If you're raising, uh, if you're selling shares, the board has to approve it. If you're entering into a material transaction, such as a lease, the board has to approve that. If you're granting stock options, the board has to approve that. So the board is very important um, for anything material that the company wants to do. And that's why a lot of focus is paid to who gets on the board. Um, initially, the board will consist of founders, not surprisingly. But as you raise money, in typically in a price round, if it's a safe round or a convertible note round, you generally do not have to give a board seat. But in a priced, either a series seed, a larger series seed round, or in a series A financing, you will be required to um, usually give an investor a board seat. And as you raise successive rounds, the lead investor will often require that they get a board seat. And I think this is the last one. Last but not least, properly structure your first round of funding. So you've started the company, you've issued shares to the founders, maybe you have one or two employees and you're going out to raise money. Um, a sort of very common approach is for your first fundraise, you do a seed or even a, what's now called a pre-seed round where you raise under a convertible instrument where you don't have to determine a value for the company. That is the, the benefit of using either a safe or a convertible note is companies very early, still in product development, they're not any metrics. What's this company? What's the valuation? Convertible notes and safes allow you to defer that determination to the next actual price round. And so you can raise, uh, this is a very typical path, raise a safe for anywhere between you know, 250 to $2 million. And that, that's the general um, parameter that I've seen. And, um, and those safe instruments will convert into shares issued in the next 
preferred stock round, priced round, in which the company raises a certain minimum amount, usually three to $5 million. So it's a, way, it's a way to raise money. Safe holders and note holders don't have voting rights. They don't get a lot of rights that, uh, that investors in a priced round would get. If you're doing a price round, investors will get a panoply of rights and their shares will vote. And one of the rights they will get will be the right to veto certain company actions. And so early on, I would say most companies will go the route of issuing either a convertible note or a safe. So I will, that is it for now. I'm literally skimming the top of the trees here. Um, I'd love to spend all evening with you guys, but I, I realize time is, is precious. Uh, I want to open it up for any questions that anyone has. Um, and, um, you know, happy to, happy to answer any questions. And then also you should feel free to reach out to me um, if you have any follow-up. Yes, thank you very much, Sam. Um, and I have also shared your um, bio and then attached PDF in our record site. So now we are going to the Q&A session. And then if anyone is interested in asking Sam a question, please feel free to unmute yourself or use the return function or type your question in the chat box. Um, I see. Oh, I was going to say, or, or you could actually just talk. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Sure. And I see Anton is raised your hand and then feel free to unmute yourself. For sure, I, I wasn't first though. There were a lot of other people who were ahead of me. Uh, if no, no one minds, I'll, I'll, I'll ask the question since I was called on. Um, sorry, everyone. Well, I have a couple of questions. One is like super selfish um, and the other one is gonna annoy you. So um, it's gonna be great, I'm sure. Um, the Let's first one it. is, <laughs> sorry. I was hoping someone else will ask something nice about your childhood or like your alma mater <laughs> or whatever. Um, but I guess I got to, uh, tossed in first with a bad question. So once the employee leaves a company and they have signed off their, um, their patent rights, um, do they return, retain some sort of a control or once they sign the correct documents, um, they are basically uh, never gonna be able to develop in this direction ever again. Like they, they, if they pursue some sort of a, a follow-on technology, then it'll be necessarily based on their work on their prior work at a different company. Like basically, does that mean that if you join as, a, as an employee, uh, a company, that means whatever you work at that company, you can never work on that again and generate IP? That, that doesn't sound right, does it? No, I think that's a, that, that statement's overly broad. I, I do think that if you work for an employer, let's say you work for Cisco, you are an inventor of a patent and you know Cisco owns that patent technology. They own that technology. You, you clearly can't develop anything that infringes on that patent, assuming the patent's valid. But the question of whether or not you could then develop derivative works or supplemental IP is a very, very technical question. Um, I think you, there is flexibility to do that subject to other types of restrictions that you may be subject to. So for instance, what if you signed a confidentiality and invention assignment agreement that covers not only patentable inventions, but all sorts of intellectual property. So let's say the thing that is the basis of your derivative work was covered by that agreement. So that would be a problem for you then to go take that idea and then develop on it. But just looking at patent law, I don't think so. I think, I think you could, I think there is space there, depending on, and this comes down to a very, very technical issue, Anton, and fact and, and fact specific issue about the specific technology that is the subject of the patent and the specific technology that is that you're extending. Mm -hmm. So yes. I, I've heard something similar before. I was ready for it. <clears throat> there is no good answer to, to, to this thing. Well, it, um, it, 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 and that's why they have patent infringement cases that turn on a lot of these types of issues that are you know, run 
you know, nine months in volumes and volume analyzing. You know, so it's not just a, you know, a quick answer. For sure. And the second thing is something that I think um, is sort of common to Berkeley. I don't know how common this is. I've never heard like Stanford startup people mention this, but I hear this a lot more recently and a lot more from Berkeley founders about control, about being able to retain uh, a certain, as a founder, a certain position, being able to insulate yourself from the decisions of, of uh, VCs and uh, kind of have your own um, your own cake and eat it, basically pull, uh, I don't know, a Zuckerberg or, or something similar. And that is the focus from early on. Obviously, if they're a hot startup, they can probably pull in that direction if they really, really want to. Uh, but from the point of view of a, we are literally a shell company and an idea, like a, a startup uh, that's basically just a dream. How much leverage do they have in this? Is this becoming sort of more common or is it just my bubble of, of founders that I know? That are no, I think sort of I, I think it is a common thought <clears throat> that um, um, founders ask about ask me all the time about. I heard about you know super voting stock. Should we do that? The the dilemma I think um, for early stage companies, especially when you're just starting the companies, you can do anything you want, right? You could put the Cadillac of founder control and put every bell and whistle in your company, you could do that. No one's gonna be there to push back, but there will be a reckoning and there may be a consequence. If when you go to raise your first round of financing and investors go and look at your charter documents, that may or may not, by the way, this due diligence that I keep mentioning that investors will do, if, if you do a, a pre-seed round where you're uh, issuing notes or safes, the diligence is pretty light. But once you do a price round, the diligence is going to be more fulsome. They will look at that and there will be an issue. And they may say, th this may be two things. This is what I tell founders. You're lucky if they say, you know, this is too aggressive. Would you mind, you know, ameliorating some of these control mechanisms or removing some of them? You're lucky if that happens. You're also lucky if, you're, if your company is so hot as in this open source company that I mentioned before, that investors are like, we don't care, can we invest? And there are companies like that. Where, where it becomes a problem is the investors don't ask to change it, but it creates a perception and a concern among who they're getting in bed with when they invest, do they really know the founders? And early stage investing, I will tell you this, and it's, it may sound cliche, is a big part of it. Investors are investing in the founders. Inevitably, and I can't tell you this, virtually every company I represent pivots at some point. The successful ones will pivot. Very rare that what you're doing when you're two people who have a, a company and just the two of you working on an idea that that's the thing that's going to become the billion dollar company. There's a lot of iteration. So anyway, I said a lot of things there, but what I tell clients is be measured. Um, you can put some control devices in at this stage, but um, be mindful that they're going to get a look at once you raise when you when you raise a price round. Thank you so much. Yeah. Does anyone else have any questions? Um, I do have a question from um, our students. She mm -hmm. asked. What promoted your decision to join Fenwick? And then what's the company culture like at Fenwick? Ah, okay. Um, so I, before I went to law school, let me give you a quick background. I started a company in undergrad. I started and sold a company. I ended up, actually ended up leaving undergrad to build this company with two co-founders. Um, ended up selling it and then went back, got my degree and um, 
after I got my degree, then went to law school, graduated in 93, uh, and went to work for a very old school uh, national law firm doing uh, legal work for big financial institutions. Uh, not, not from, from my perspective, wonderful work, but not the most, not the most interesting thing for me. Um, being an entrepreneur and um, also being in San Francisco and seeing what was going on in the mid nineties and the late nineties in the Silicon Valley, it was, it was a bit like it is today. Very exciting, a lot of entrepreneurship, a lot of new startups. And I, as at that point, I decided to lateral to Fenwick West. I had offers from all the law firms. I liked Fenwick for a couple of different reasons. One is its core, at it, it, its core, less so now, at the time was it was very, very focused on intellectual property. Um, most of its partners at the time had engineering degrees. And that was very different. So they had law degrees and engineering degrees. That was very, very different than a lot of the other law firms like Wilson and Cooley and others. Secondly, it has a very open culture. So one of the things that Fanwick and West has that not a lot of other firms have is what's called a free market system. And it, you know, it just sort of pulled back the cover on how law firms work. Oftentimes, associates who work for senior associates who work for partners are assigned a group or a pod, and they have to work for that partner that heads that pod, and that's who they're assigned to. Um, Fenwick's system is different. We, associates can work for the partners they want to work with, and that creates an environment where partners are interested in career development and mentorship and bringing the associates along as a team because you want you need associate resource in order to provide the best service to your clients. So th those two reasons were big in my mind as to why, why I went to Fenwick and also because they were just, they were in a very dominant position. They're smaller, they were smaller than Wilson, but they had basically an equally dominant position in terms of the startups they were representing and, and the types of companies they were working for. And so I liked, I like that a, a great deal. So. Okay, thank you. And does anyone else have any questions? Um, then I can continue asking the question that we submit earlier. Um, actually, yeah. Um, how was your experience as the chief ex executive officer at Design Look Publications and what promote you to take on that role considering your background is in law? Well, Design Look Publications, I started before I was a lawyer. I was an undergrad. I have a very circuitous career path. Um, before I went to college, I um, played two years of professional tennis. Uh, I went to undergrad on a tennis scholarship. Um, and then while in undergrad, I, so with two other people, started this publishing company. Uh, in, in the, I'm really going to date myself now in the 80s. Um, and it, it, was, it wasn't a technology company, but it was a very complicated business. One of our products were, were calendars that we had our, our, our innovation was that on these wall calendars, instead of putting like scenes of like parks and nature and cats and kittens, although we did do that, was to license. So we did the first Madonna calendar, we did the first Michael Jackson calendar, and we were in college. And we were getting these licenses very, very cheaply because, you know, Madonna was like, what, wall calendar? We, we don't care. Yeah, sure. Go ahead. Knock yourself out. So the business grew very fast, um, but it was a complicated business. It was, uh, you know, like um, um, selling calendars because they have a shelf life. It's like selling yogurt. After the first of the year, you know, the, 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 the shelf life goes to zero. And so that, there was that complexity and also the complexity of also producing these things overseas in Japan uh, and in Thailand and then eventually China. So. I learned a lot and appreciated a lot running a business um, like that. 
Um, and it's one of the reasons I think why I gravitated toward corporate law. And one of the reasons I gravitate towards the Silicon Valley and Fenwick and working with tech companies and entrepreneurs. Okay. Um, and then we have a question from Brianna, if I pronounce your name right. Feel free to unmute yourself. Yeah. Um, thanks, Sam, for presenting tonight. I was just interested in hearing more about how you choose which tech startups to represent. Yeah, it's a good, it's a very good company. It's not unlike um, an analysis that investors make. Um, and it has changed as my, um, as I've gotten older and my career has gone, you know, I represent more clients. Um, I think a big part of it is who the founders are, um, just like an investor, what's their background. Um, I think also what traction has the company achieved? Um, I, I, you know, as I mentioned, you know, Airbnb, you know, um, Brian Chesky and Joe Gebbia came into my office and they hadn't even formed a company. I mean, they literally had an idea and we, we bounced around ideas and this is, you know, and I, rep I ended up representing them and I've, I've represented other companies in that position. So I will take on very early companies. I will also take on, you know, representing public companies. Uh, a lot depends on do I like the people and does the technology or the business really interest me and ha does it have traction? So I think I think those are sort of, you know, those are sort of general things that I that that, that are important when I when I'm looking at whether to take on companies. So. Thank you. And then we have a question from Wusi. Um, feel free to unmute yourself. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah, I can I can hear you now. Who is who is speaking? Oh, yeah, this is Lucy. Yeah, sorry about that. Hi Lucy. Yeah, my question was about Yes, people like me who are more tech-minded and very new to the business aspects of entrepreneurship, how would you recommend learning more? Like, would you say mm -hmm. courses or books or just meeting people like you and you know asking questions like right now? Like, how do I get up-to-date skills in a more effective manner? Yeah, no, it's a good question. And I think, um, so I think, you're going to want to, so first of all, there's lots of resources at Fenwick. We, at our, you go to fenwick.com, we have a lot of resources at fenwick.com. There are different tech organizations in the Valley that have a lot of great resources that I'm, I'm sure you're aware of, you know, um, incubators like YC. There's also, I know um, Berkeley has a bunch of incubators as well. Those can be very, very um, helpful resources for learning about the more business oriented sides of things. And the other thing I would um, sort of keep in mind is also getting mentors, forming relationships with people in different aspects of business, be it legal, be it uh, financial, um, people, you know, HR. Um, so go to network events and meet people and expand your network. That's how, that's how you learn about different areas of business. Business is one term that encompasses a lot of different things. And so um, I, I think that um, you're gonna have to go to a couple different places or a few different places to sort of develop understanding and, and knowledge in those areas. Yeah, I think that really helps. It sounds like yeah, you're really advocating for really talking to people directly and mentorship and whatnot. Would you say then that a lot of books are kind of out of date by the time I, they get into my hands and whatnot? I, I think there are some, no, I mean, I think there are some books and some articles you can read. There's a lot of articles out there on entrepreneurship and organizations like there's, um, 
that offer a lot of great advice. So I think it's one piece of the pie. And I also think that there's learning about sort of the basics of business. And then there's the aspect of executing and how you execute, how you be an effective leader, how do you hire people? Um, what are things, um, uh, pitfalls to avoid as an entrepreneur and things like that. So I think there's, there's a lot of things you can learn from people, but I also, I, I, wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't necessarily say that books um, can't be valuable. Yeah, thank you so much. And then, sure. I know it's kind of a lot, but I do have one follow up, which sure. which is, yes, yeah, so when you look at different groups of co-founders and kind of related to that topic, yeah, do you see more success in groups where one of the co-founders is dedicated to kind of finance and chartering and making sure, you know, the IP is correct and all that or do you consider it essential for all of the co-founders to have a really strong understanding of the process regardless of you know if their main task is more like cto than cfo yeah no it's a very good question i think a lot of times the way founders come together is quite organic uh and uh, sometimes it's too technical founders who don't really have a, a good understanding of it, anything other than the technology which is fine um, the Valley has, and I'm, I am confident will continue to highly value technical founders. And, um, and, and I've worked with other companies where the founders have been one founder who has deep techno expertise and another founder who has um, more of the business end of things. And um, so I think they can both, it can work both ways. Um, I think investors tend to value the technology part of this more, but I think part of that is because most, most investors come from a world of finance and business, and they figure that they can sort of, they, they can make up for any deficiencies that the company has in those areas. But, but I've, seen, I, I've seen it work both ways, and I think the most, the most important quality is less about sort of domain, although that's important. Uh, and it, it's more about persistence. I would say that that is the single most, you know, most important character attribute that I have come across. That is literally persistence and not giving up and iterating, changing, and doing what works that, um, in, in my, from my perspective, has been sort of a, if I was to draw a pattern, that would be it in terms of the character of, of founders who are successful. Yeah, that's really helpful. Yeah, thank you so much. It really helps my own team building sure. as well. I'm glad, that, I'm glad that's helpful. Um, does anyone else have any questions? I have a question if, if I'm allowed to ask. Yeah, sure. So, um, Sam, thank you for the great presentation. I was just wondering if you could probably elaborate on some of the legal obligations that founders have if their venture fails. I'm asking because one of my friends actually had an LLC and I heard that he had to make sure all of his bank accounts were closed, uh, business bank accounts were closed at least after the you know business shut down. So I, I was just wondering if you can elaborate on, on some of the other legal implications. Sure. Yeah, I mean, yeah, as I mentioned, one of the benefits of operating a corporation or an LLC or a partnership, a legal entity, is that you have the, the owners of the company have limited liability to the creditors of the company. And so as a practical matter, if a company goes under uh, and has creditors, the creditors can only seek recourse against the assets of the company. And if the company doesn't have any assets, too bad. He, they cannot go after the shareholders um, there's a doctrine in the law called piercing the corporate veil. That is one exception to that rule. And it is extremely rare. Uh, and, the, and the facts and circumstances usually do not involve technology companies. It involves you know, a creditor can pierce the corporate veil and go directly against the shareholders where there's some active wrongdoing by the shareholders. Um, you know, where the shareholders are sort of directly involved in the, in the wrongdoing and where the company doesn't observe corporate formalities. But other than that very narrow exception, 
creditors cannot go after the owners of the company. And that's why you know, one of the reasons we say it's important once you start incurring obligations to, to, to form a, a company. Um, if you want to wind up the company properly, there's a, there's a procedure and there's a process to follow um, where you can do so. And as everyone's familiar with bankruptcy, which is more involved and can, can provide a path for a company to reemerge from um, an insolvent situation, but more likely than not, uh, companies heading into to bankruptcy end up just dissolving and going away. And most private companies that don't make it where the founders walk away and the investors walk away are simply just dissolved. They don't go through bankruptcy. They are just the entity. Sometimes the entity is just left to exist as sort of a, a, a ghost company. Um, so if you're doing things right, you shouldn't be subject to liabilities is, is the way I put it. Awesome. Thank you for that. Sure. Um, I think because of the time-wise, we're um, to kind of run out of time and then we will move on to other activities. I want to sure. say thank you very much, Sam, for joining us today and then we're really honored to have you speak for our class um, and thank you. No, my pleasure. Great, to, great group. And uh, I will be at the Decode conference on Sunday interviewing uh, David Hornick who is a partner in August, at August Capital. So if anyone can make that, uh, that would be, it'd be great to see you. So thanks again. Thank you. Bye-bye. And it would be great, Jane, if you could share the slides. Hey everyone. Um, so for logistics this week, um, we have the week 10 peer assignment due on this Thursday, November 18th. Um, and for this assignment, we want you to complete a peer review process with your classmates because we think it's going to be a good way of uh, sharing your semester pitch projects with your other assigned group to provide feedback for one another. Um, this will also serve as like a means for you to further develop your portfolio for demo day. So just remember that this is a group assignment, meaning that each team is responsible for submitting only one response. But if you want to learn more about the specifics of the assignment, um, feel free to head over to B courses um, in the assignments tab and all the details or information are written out there for you. And if you still have any questions, feel free to reach out to any one of us through our emails. But yeah. And there's no class next Thursday because of Veterans Day. <laughs>